Nothing warms the heart like a forced standing ovation. Just, <laughs> I felt the sincerity. My gosh, I love being back at Southwest. I absolutely love Ricky and April and Ab Cam, Grant, and Andy and this family. Um, Ricky and I have this, just this friendship. I know with April and Amy as well, but we've got this eternal pact that uh, whoever gets fired first immediately goes and works with the other one. Um, I think I'm closer to that line than he may be. Uh, but I, we said, hey, if you ever lose your job, call each other first. That way you can call your spouse and say, hey, babe, I got bad news and good news. Bad news is I lost my job. Good news is I got one already. But um, absolutely love this family. Love, love, love this church. I don't get out and travel and speak much anymore. My choice. I love just staying at home. My family, our church, my kids. But um, when Ricky and I get a chance to help each other out in churches, just love being out here. Plus, this is 40 degrees different than my church today. So, <laughs> my gosh. We are going to be taking a look at a story today. If you got a Bible, John chapter four, go to the back of the Bible, look for the guy's names, flip around, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all pretty big books, John four. If you don't know where to find it, go to the front of the Bible. Jesus wrote the table of contents that tells you what page John is on, John chapter four. Drink it if you got it. She pauses one more time just inside the door just to look at her reflection. She'll grab one of the many scarves that are hanging on the hooks, wrap it around her neck, over her head, pull it down just below the eyebrows and tuck it in. She, um, she tells her friends that she loves accessorizing. It's why she has so many scarves. Helps keep the sun off in the desert. Those that know her best know it helps conceal an identity. It's just another layer of hiding who she is, where she's been, what she's done. She will bend down and pick up the large jug, cradle it almost like an infant. One more time in the reflection, she will wink. <laughs> One of her closest friends told her years ago to help with her low self-esteem, her feelings of uh, unlovable, unworth. Before you leave the house every day, why don't you wink at yourself and tell yourself that you're lovable? She's, she's long since given up the lovable part, but the wink still remains. And with that, she'll undo the latch on the big wooden door, step into the sunlight, and start moving down the street. Eyes always down at her feet, never looking up. Every glare seems like a stare. Every glance seems like a judgment. So she will move as quickly as she can through the crowd. Her entire goal is to go three blocks up, two blocks to the right, three blocks to the left, and be outside the city. And she didn't plan on it on this day. But the moment she got to the corner of the market, someone had set up a brand new shop, reams and reams of new linen and silk scarves, colors like she's never seen before. She will allow herself this moment of window shopping, if you will, to put her jug down and let her fingers run through the tapestry and linen and silk from, from countries she's never heard of. She doesn't have the money to buy, but a woman can dream. <laughs> and that's when she hears them. Just on the other side of the silk cloth that is hanging, they haven't noticed her yet. Oh, but she knows them. And that, that fear grips. Well, she will grab her jug and quickly duck out to the right. Once again, head down, now moving twice the speed, as fast as she can through the little shopping center in the market, out through the large wooden gates. It takes about two to 300 yards before you clear the commotion of the city. And once on the small dirt path, her pulse will slow down. Her steps will too. With a glance over her shoulder, she will undo her scarf, lower it down, and she will take her first few breaths deeply. It's, uh, it's as if cactus don't care, desert shrubs don't judge, dry bushes don't hold memories, they don't point, they don't whisper. It's almost amongst the 
the drying and dead of the wilderness, she can feel a little alive and she will walk. With the heat of the day now just burning down on her, she's about 200 yards away from a small bend and then her destination. And once again, the fear she can feel. What if they're there? What if on this day she is known for who she is and what she's done? It's her greatest nightmare. And little does she know on this day, she will be taken through her greatest nightmare. Because only on walking through that will she find freedom. Oh, this is going to be a good one. We got to catch up to the lens of scripture. It's already gone through the first few verses. If you got your Bible, it's in John chapter four. Get your popcorn out and get your Diet Coke. I guess your movie series starts next month, but we're starting with this one today. I want you to see it with your own flat screen. John chapter four, verse one, simply starts like this. Now the Pharisees, you know, the religious leaders in charge, heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptizing, but his disciples. And when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, now, here's all you need to know about the first few verses. We don't have the time to get into it, but there's a big political squabble going on. People are picking sides right now. They're counting who's got more votes. And it seems like Jesus is getting more votes than the religious leaders. So instead of getting into the political battle, Jesus just decides to leave the area altogether. So he heads from Jerusalem down to Galilee. Now, this is where the story changes. It simply says, now he had to go through Samaria. Circle, highlight, underline, had to go. Let me tell you at this day and age, everyone from the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem has to go up to Jerusalem. It is your headquarters. It is your capital, if you will. Not just for your nation, but spiritually. But no one goes through Samaria. Everyone crosses the river and goes around Samaria. So when the Bible says Jesus had to go, you have to stop. You have to circle, highlight, underline, had to. Remember, this is the son of God. Remember, this is the creator who for a time has laid aside being God and creator and came to earth to show us how to live this life and who he was. So when Jesus has to do something, you realize Jesus doesn't had to anything. That's that's really bad English, but that's great theology. Jesus doesn't had to anything. So when it says Jesus had to, you may want to stop and go, oh, something big's going on. On his had to do list, this is it. On what Jesus had to accomplish, this is it. And and here's why I want to break this down so big. Because I believe this is where you and I are going to come today. I believe, and forgive me, don't judge me, but I'm a visiting pastor, I can say what I want. (laughs) I believe our God is simply the God. The one true God. Creator God. He hasn't gotten smarter over time. He hasn't gotten better over time. He hasn't figured out people over time. He doesn't have more degrees. He hasn't gone to school. He doesn't have a better education. He is God. Therefore, the way he dealt with people back then is the day he deals with us now. You understand that? See, the way he dealt with people back. I knew, I know. It's 11 o'clock in the sun. You already had to get through some sort of hell to come to heaven today. You're worn out. You're already dripping. You're just glad you made it. But I'm going to need a little more than that. Therefore, the way Jesus dealt with people back is the way he deals with us. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to share openly. I mean, I mean, God forbid we ever get honest in church. What if, what if today you have to face your greatest nightmare? What if? It's the story he's gonna invite her to. I think it's where we find our story today. This is what he had to do. And as he goes through Samaria, he came to a town called Sychar, Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, as tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. You see, it was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, You're you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. 
How can you ask me for a drink? You see, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. For us to get the entire context of this story, we got to stop and go back to 2,000 years. 2,000 years to understand one of the greatest race wars that's ever taken place. One of the greatest lines and divides of hatred and animosity between two people groups that ever lived. The Jews and the Samaritans. And this is what Jesus had to do. He had to go through Samaria. And right there in the first century, if you're hearing this story, there would have been a gasp out of this crowd. (gasps) Jesus doesn't go to Samaria. You don't cross those tracks. You don't go to that side of town. You don't go to those people. We don't even say the S word in a church like this. You see, the Samaritans had their chance over and over and over again, and they blew it. It goes all the way back when... When the great Assyrian Empire came in, the Babylonian Empire came in, the Egyptians came in, when your little people were just a pawn, and when your people got taken off to different foreign entities like Babylon, and they left some in your nation, and those some that were in your nation were supposed to stay great Hebrew, great Jewish people. After all, you have this great title, you know? We're the chosen ones. We're the children of God. Isn't it amazing when you've done nothing to deserve a title, but God gives it to you? After a while of wearing that title, you're better than most. Isn't it amazing what we do with titles? And you start looking down on. God created out of nothing the biggest loser in the known world at that time, Abraham, a man who had nothing going for him, no children, no claim to fame, was about to die and just turned to dirt. And God called him from the backwoods, idle, hillbilling countryside of the Babylonian empire and said, if you leave everything, I'll make you a great nation. And Abraham and Sarah are like, that's 60 years too late, bro. He goes, I'll do it. Just so you can't claim me, I'll always claim you. And as the nation of Israel grew, the title grew. And it's about the haves and the have-nots. You see, when some were deported to Babylon, some of your Hebrew people left. But instead of saying good, pure Jewish people, they started intermarrying and intermarrying and intermarrying. And you know what happens. Your Bible gets a little watered down. You may still have people like Abraham and Jesus, but they're different. Your worship is different. Your church service is different. You start believing different. When the good Hebrew Jewish people came back, you've had your chance and you blew it. You polluted our Bible. You polluted our people. You are the S word. And for hundreds of years, the hatred has been building. She knows it. When he goes there at the sixth hour, the Jewish day starting at 6 a.m., so 6 a.m., six hours mean it's 12 noon. This is what he had to do. When he goes and sits by a well in the desert at 12 noon, come on, people. What are you gonna do outside at 12 noon? Nothing. You're gonna die. You better be by water with an umbrella, with an umbrella drink. That's what you better do out here at 12 noon. My wife and I were out here yesterday at 12 noon. You can't even walk on your ground without melting a (laughs) flip-flop. What in the world is she doing there at noon? It's the same today as it was then. You have a water supply. There's no running water inside the city. So you go early in the morning and you get enough water for you and your family for the entire day. If you don't have enough to make it through the night, as you usually don't, you will come back in the cool of the evening and you will get water again. But you don't go at noon. You don't go when the sun is blaring down on you. At noon, you don't have enough water through the night. In the morning, you have to, you're just inefficient. Today in Haiti, we do a lot of work in Haiti. It's the same thing. In port au pay out by St. Louis de Nord, there's a pipe that comes through a big concrete wall. The government has a pipe for the entire city of running water. Whatever type of faucet, whatever type of nozzle they put on it always gets broken off, so they don't even try anymore. It's just a broken pipe. And at O'Dark 100, you will see people lined up on both sides of the pipe. You see, you don't make one line at a well. You make two. It's more efficient. That way I can get my bucket or buckets, and instead of the person behind me waiting for me to get out of the way, the person directly across from me, as soon as I'm done, puts his bucket in the way, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. So when your community stands in line in the morning and in the evening, it's where your community news happens. It's where you find out what's going on, who's going on. It's where the talk of the town happens. No one goes at noon. No one goes in the heat. But she's going to be there. And this is what he 
had to do. And she is shocked. A, a, a guy like you doesn't talk to a woman like me. And he catches her completely off guard. And she's about to realize her greatest nightmare. Jesus answered her in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Man, if you had any idea what God wants to do in your life, if you had any idea the gift that God wants to give you right now, you would be asking him and you would get living water, bubbling water, running water, cool water, not water from a well, not water from a cistern, not water that tastes like chalk and tastes like clay. I mean, if that's the best you got, that's the best you got. But I'm talking about living water. Now he's being a little bit vague here. Are you talking like bubbling, running stream water? Are you talking about living water? water? What is going on in this conversation? And she'll play along. She wants to know what's happening. Sir, the woman said, you've got nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where are you going to get living water? Are, Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus said, look, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. In fact, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Oh, he's quite a salesman, isn't he? Lady, you're coming at noon. You're coming at the wrong time of day. You're the only one out here, and that's why I'm the only one out here to meet you. You see, this is what he has to do. This woman's not gonna go to church. And unfortunately, the church isn't going to go to this woman either. She's not going to hear what we call the gospel. It's a big churchy stained glass word. She's not going to hear the good news that Jesus has a different life to offer, the gift that he just talked about. I can do something in your life, through your life, that's completely different than the life you're living now. She's not going to hear that because she's not going to go to church, and the church is not going to go to an S woman like her. So he will. He'll cross every line. He'll break every boundary. He'll cut right through every cultural norm. Oh, it will. The gospel, the news of Jesus will get to the Gentile world, but not in her lifetime. It'll be too late for her. So he goes to her. Lady, you don't understand what I'm selling here. I want to do something in you, living water in you. Have you ever hated it when you were alone? When the worst time in your life is when you're laying in a bed by yourself because when you're by yourself, you hate the company you're with. And I hated it when the friends were gone. I hated it when the person I was with was gone. I could be the life of the party. I'm gonna be a fun guy. I loved on Friday nights. Everyone was checking with me to find out where I was going because that's where they were gonna go. And I hated when everyone left. And I hated when I went to bed and I wasn't tired because the worst place in the world was laying in bed just being with me. He said, that's what I'm gonna change. I'm gonna do something in your life, welling up in your life. You'll never thirst again. You'll never be in want again. When's the last time you had pure contentment with who you are and where you are in life? When's the last time you just had joy, not based on what was going on in your life or around your life, but just joy? When was the last time there was something in you and you love being alone because you knew you're never going to be alone again? I'm offering this and it sounds too good to be true. And the lady wants to buy a gallon of it. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She knew what it was like to be empty. She knew it was like to thirst. She's kind of confusing this metaphor that he's doing because I don't have to come back to the well anymore, but you're going to give me something that's going to change who I am. And he told her, just go call your husband and come back. You see, it's like a timeshare presentation. I need both of you. It's going to take about an hour, hour and a half, but at the end, I'm going to give you a couple prizes. One could be living water, maybe a luau, or maybe a dinner out, but you got to sit through a presentation. Can you go to your husband and come back? And this is now where the woman needs to straighten out Jesus in this story, because she responds, I have no husband. And that's kind of embarrassing if you're Jesus. 
You don't find a lot of places in the Bible where Jesus gets it wrong, but this is one of them. So anytime you get to a place in the Bible where Jesus gets it wrong, you may want to pay attention because maybe he ain't. (laughs) He's the only guy that can get away with this, by the way. He's the only guy that can walk up to a woman and go, oh, when did you do? And she's all, I'm not pregnant. He goes, oh, yes, you are. (laughs) I'm not quite wrong on this one, ma'am. Ooh, sorry about your job. No, I got a good job. Yeah, you're gonna get a call on Monday. Ooh, ooh. Let me go get your husband. Yeah, I don't have a husband. Yeah, you're right when you say you don't have a husband, but the fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. So what you have said is quite true. Ooh. Well, Now we know why she's at the well at noon. (laughs) You're not gonna show up in the morning and stand in line with the other women and hear the talk of the town when you're the talk of the town. There's at least five. And the guy she's currently sleeping with is somebody else's. Now, unfortunately, I think it can go two ways here. I grew up in church hearing this taught where she's the town. I don't even want to use an adjective. She's the one with loose morals. She's been sleeping around and she's been caught. Unfortunately, if you go back and study first century, I think that's given her and culture way too much credit. Women in the first country, first century, especially in this part of the world, didn't have a lot of church, choice, power, or authority. I think the reality is she's been used. She's been discarded. She's been found wanting again and again and again and again and again. And she knows she's in the wrong arms now of someone who's just using her on the side. But being in the wrong arms sometimes is better than being in no arms. And for a woman who's been used six times in the first century, there's a lot of reason to avoid the crowd in the morning and the evening and to pull the scarf down as tight as you can and walk through the city as quick as you can. She's damaged goods. She's broken. She knows it and the town knows it. And this is what he had to do. We don't usually go there, church. We stop at the sentence of head. The moment the woman says, hey, sir, give me this water so I don't have to get thirsty and come here. We right, stop right there and we have people say a prayer. Hey, how many of you know that Jesus, Jesus loves you? Boys and girls, listen, boys and girls, boys and girls. Look, look, listen, listen, look, look, listen, listen. And from the time we were in second and third grade in our little seats, we all looked up. Boys and girls, look, look, listen, listen. Jesus came down and he died on the cross to forgive you of all your sins. And one day you're gonna die, and if you say this prayer, you go to heaven. But if you don't, you're gonna go to hell and burn forever. How many of you wanna say this prayer? More like me. Dude, I live in Palm Desert. I don't wanna try the hell option. (laughs) As soon as someone says, hey, I want this living water. I want this inside of me. Stop and say a prayer. Jesus doesn't. She goes, sir, I want this living water. I want what you're giving me. And he goes, no, not a chance. I need to talk to your husband. I need to go there. Why, why do you need to go there? There's a true saying that Jesus wants all of us. I'm not saying all of us. I'm saying all of you. All of you. And he goes right to the part that he knows he doesn't have. He goes right to the part that he knows is going to wear off as soon as the sermon is done. Let's talk about your sex life. I'd rather not talk about my sex life. He goes, then we're not going to say a prayer. Well, why is that? He goes, because that's what I'm going after. I want you. Oh, I want you. So, so let me tell you what's happening The woman said, oh, I can see that you're a prophet. (laughs) You're good. Oh, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. You Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. What? 
She does what we think we're supposed to do. The moment you've been caught that things should be going better for you, the moment you realize, yeah, I think I should get God in my life, what do you do? You turn to religion, and that's all she's doing. I know you guys have a big church. We have a church. I've been thinking about going back to church. I've been thinking about getting religious. You know, I think I've got enough guilt in my life or some shame. I've done my own stuff. I think it's time for me to go back to church and get religious. Watch how quickly Jesus slams religion in her face. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. I'm not talking about going to church. Religion's also gonna leave you with guilt and shame. Oh, that's the problem of church. This woman's been You know the number one reason why people don't go to church? Because they've been. It just gave me more guilt and shame. It just piled up more stuff on me. Just another preacher preaching on stuff I gotta do. I got enough guilt and shame in my life. I don't need it from a church and I sure don't need it from a pastor. I've been. But once again, he faces with the guilt and shame of her life. She goes, yeah, I've been thinking about going back to church. He's all, look, I'm not talking about going to church. He goes, let me explain to you what I'm getting at. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation will come from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Circle, highlight, underline. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must, circle that, worship him in spirit and in truth. Circle, highlight, underline. Lady, I'm not talking about you trying to worship God spiritually. Oh, Southwest, this is why I don't travel and don't speak much, but when Ricky asks, or when we can flip-flop churches, I love being out here, because this seems to actually be a church that gets it. It's not about what you do in here. This is spiritual. And you can come in and have the best 11 o'clock service ever. You can come in here and have great worship. Man, worship, now these people lined up. And, oh, and got the big screens. Maybe they'll even play one of your favorites. Maybe they'll go back and pull out Good, Good Father. Oh, isn't that good? It's good. It's who you are. It's who you are. And then you get to the part where it's all about me. It's all, yeah. <laughs> the absolute best worship experience in this 11 o'clock venue. It's going to last you how long? I'll answer that question. How far are you parked? Because <laughs> the moment you walk back in that car and the moment you shut the doors, you're back with you. And that's the truth. And that's the truth. And I promise you, Jesus Christ himself could show up on this stage and spend an hour and a half pouring love into you. And it'll last until you get to your car. If it's a spiritual moment, Jesus goes, let me tell you the time is coming. In fact, it's now here. Where real worship has to happen in spirit and in truth. For the type of worshipers my father desires must worship in spirit and in truth. Oh, lady, you're ready to say a prayer. You're ready to receive living water into your life. But I want the truth about you. Let's talk about him. Well, I don't have a him right now. Well, that's kind of right and kind of incorrect. You've had five, and the guy you're currently sleeping with isn't yours. You're a prophet. He's on that truth. I want the truth. Because that's what you have to walk out of here with today. You can't keep trying to worship God religiously and spiritually without the truth about who you are and where you've been and what you've done, or God forbid, what's been done to you. Because that's true, folks. That's true. There's something inside of her that's starting to get pulled in this direction. And the woman said, I I know that the Messiah, the one called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Oh, I think there should be a question mark on the end of that. When I meet the Christ, he's going to make it clear. I who speak to you am he. Hey, girl, you're sitting with him. 
That's why these words I've been speaking in red have been hitting your heart like nothing else ever has. You're sitting with them. And this is what he had to do. Just in the disciples' return. Oh, doesn't church have a way of interrupting all the good stuff? Just then his disciples returned and they were surprised to find him talking with the woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? <laughs> they understand there's a cultural faux pas going on here. They understand in the first century, any good rabbi wouldn't speak to a woman in public, even a Jewish woman. There's an entire sect of rabbis at the time in the first century that were so devout, so conservative, they called themselves the bloodied and bruised because anytime they would even pass a woman on the street or be around, they would close their eyes and walk and they'd bump into things constantly. Another piousness of showing how I'm spiritual, more spiritual than you. A good rabbi in the first century wouldn't talk to his wife in public for fear of being misconstrued of having a relationship with another woman. I know. Some of you women are like, oh, I married a rabbi. That makes sense. He just, I don't get much out of him. He grunts, but that's about it. And when the disciples come back, they see him talking with her, and they all know this is wrong on every count. It's wrong because she's a Samaritan. It's wrong because she's a female. It's wrong because he's a rabbi. It's wrong because it's noon. It's wrong because the only reason a woman would be here, it's just wrong. But how do you tell Jesus he's wrong? Even Peter stays silent in this. They all come back and they all got their rolled tacos and their Diet Cokes and they're all like, you tell them. (laughs) Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Circle, highlight, underline, who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of town and made their way toward him. Now the next eight verses are all about Jesus and the disciples. Just skip that for now. Verse 39. Now many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the circle highlight underlined woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Circle highlight underlined. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged Jesus to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. What in the world happened? The very thing this woman was scared to death of, that the townspeople would be talking about what she did. The very reason this woman goes to the well at noon is the very thing she goes and she tells everybody about after this conversation. The very thing she was hoping no one would be discussing is the very thing she runs into town and starts discussing. Three times it says they heard her story. She told them everything I've ever done. And then they came back and say, we believe for ourselves, not just because of your story. The story that she was hiding at the beginning at noon is the story by one o'clock. She's telling to everybody, what just happened? Oh, we've got seven minutes and six seconds to unpack this. You guys have a third service? We've got an hour and 40 minutes to unpack this. Let's break down what just happened so we can go home with with more than just a good Jesus story. This is about finding freedom, not just forgiveness. So the story behind the text is clear. Not dealing with the past is going to rob us of the future. People, if we don't deal with our past, it's going to rob us of our future. There's a reason your windshield is so big and your rearview mirror is so small because one is about where you're going. One is about your present and your future. One is about where you're heading. And the little one just reminds you of what was back there. The problem with what happens when we try to worship God spiritually without the truth is we're consumed by the rearview mirror. We're consumed by our past. And it's keeping us from whatever gift of living water, what God wants to do in you and through you. Why? Because that little tiny 17 inch by two inch piece of glass brings nothing but guilt and shame. And I can't see who I am and what I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to have when it's just focused on guilt and shame. 
It's my guilt and shame. What is it for you? Today, what is it in your life is it that he had to do? What is it? I'll help you identify it. What is it right now that if the section you're sitting in, what is it in your life that the section you're if everyone in the section knew about you, what is it that you would make sure you wouldn't come back here again? What is it? What is that time? What is that place? What is that person? What is that event in your life that if God forbid it was ever shown on the screen, you would never show your face here again? People, if you have an event, if you have a person, if you have a place, if you have a time in your life, let me promise you, it's got control of you. God doesn't have control of it. It is what he has to do. I'm tired of you coming and trying to worship me spiritually. I want the truth. Now, the irony is he knows the truth. He knows exactly who they are, what she's done, what's been done to her. But she's paralyzed by it. It's robbing her of her future right now. And he is going for it. Is there anything right now in your life that you'd be scared to death that this church knew about you? I promise you, that's what he's going after. Chris, how do you know that? Because the way Jesus dealt with people back is the way he deals with us. What's your truth? See, the American church does a phenomenal job talking about forgiveness. We all love forgiveness. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us our sins. All we gotta do is ask God for forgiveness, we'll be forgiven. We do a lousy job of talking about freedom. And they're two different things. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess to God, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all that unrighteousness. Do you get the end? If we confess to God, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all the guilt and shame that came with what we're asking forgiveness for. They're two different things. We believe in forgiveness, but we walk in guilt and shame. We're denying the and. This is what he's going for. I'll do it by asking for a show of hands right now. How many of you believe that if you ask God to forgive you of something in your past, that because Jesus died on the cross and paid for it, he'll forgive you? How many believe God will forgive you if you ask for forgiveness of something in your past? Okay. Second question is only for those that raised your hand. How many of you have asked for forgiveness from something in your past more than once? Keep them up. Look at all the hypocrites. There's either something fatally wrong with our God and the cross or wrong with our theology. I spent the first six years of my Christian life asking for forgiveness for the exact same things. I didn't realize God was in heaven in the most compassionate way saying, shut up, I don't wanna hear it. I forgave it six years ago. Walk in freedom, kid. Walk in freedom. But I didn't know how to do that because I was dealing with the truth about Chris. Here's what happened at the well, how to deal with our past. Number one, we're gonna have to face the truth. We have to face it. We cannot run it. Have you ever noticed that wherever you go, you're there? And a lot of you didn't write that down, but that's about as deep as I get. Wherever you go, you're there. You can't outrun yourself. I got a sister, bless her heart, even if she's watching this, she knows I love her to death. Whether it's through three marriages, about 10 different guys, six different states. Wherever she goes, she's there. You can't outrun your truth. You can't outrun your past. It is a very real thing. It is a part of you. We have to face the truth. And here's why we have to. Here's why we have to have our moment at the well with Jesus. Because our truth about us brings guilt and then shame. They're two different things. Guilt is that we feel bad because of something we're done. After a while of not treating it, it turns to shame. We don't feel bad, we are bad. See, guilt comes when we know we've broken God's law. We've broken God's word. But after a while, it turns to us just understanding we are broken. 
I feel guilty when I've done wrong. If it's untreated, I have shame. I know I'm just wrong. It's why every time you go to worship, that little voice goes, really, you? Remember this, and you just put your hands back down. Every time they start playing that song, and you think maybe today's the day I worship, and oh, really, remember him, remember her, remember 1989, remember 88 through 93, those are my years. <laughs> Chris, that wasn't a sin, that was years. Just, you got your own issue. Remember? Remember your first marriage? Remember that night? Remember that time? Remember? Yeah. And it's so hard to worship God spiritually because the truth is stronger than whatever song they're playing at the 11 o'clock service. And that's what I'm stuck walking out of here with today. I'd love for you to say a prayer, but I can't, girl. I need to talk to your husband. Well, I'm not married, I know. But I need you to face the truth. I know about the five. And I know about the one. And then we're going to have to accept the truth. We're going to have to accept the truth. We try to bury it, don't we? We try to run from it. But burying something that is alive because you're alive, it's like the old horror movies where it starts crawling out of the grave. You can't bury your past. As long as you're alive, your past is alive with you. So what do we do? We try to blame others. Well, Chris, you don't understand my dad. You don't understand the family I grew up in. You don't understand my first marriage. You don't understand my first marriage. You don't understand. And you can blame it all you want. In the end, we start blaming ourselves. I should have never let myself. It's my choices. I haven't done right. I keep putting myself back in this. I been, and where does that get you? Guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. And by the way, that's not new. That's page three of the Bible. When there were only two people on earth, Adam and Eve, and God said, don't eat the fruit. And they're like, ah, this fruit? And he's like, idiots. <laughs> What'd they do? God shows up and they hid from God. They tried to hide. They tried to bury the past. If there's two people on earth, it's not a good idea to hide from God. You got a pretty clueless God where he shows up and he's like, oh, they were here yesterday. <laughs> so they try to hide, that doesn't work. Eve blames a snake. Adam blames her and God. <laughs> he just takes them both down. The woman that you gave me, bam. How does that help the guilt and shame? We have to accept the truth. God, this happened to me. This is who I am and where I've come from. These are choices I've made. Or God, this is what's been done to me. It's true. It's true. And then we have to accept grace, not guilt. And this is where everything changed. I know one day there'll be Jesus, the Christ, and he's gonna make everything good. I who speak to you and me, I'm exchanging something that is true about you with something that is greater. I'm exchanging that I know who you are and what you've done and who you've done and where you've done it. And in spite of that, you are what I had to do today. You are why I'm sitting here at noon by the well in a God-forsaken place where people like me never walk because we're never gonna see people like you. And this is what he had to do because church isn't gonna come to you and you're not gonna go to church. And Jesus said, and those are the doors I bust through. This is what I had to do. I want you to know that I know and I'm still offering this. You're going to have to accept grace. You may be the hardest person to forgive in your life, but you're going to have to learn to forgive the way God forgave you. And then he says, walk in what I'm giving you. The creator of the universe calls you son, daughter, prince, princess, knowing who you are, where you've come from, what you've done. He goes, there's two truths in your life. There's the truth of who you are and what you've done, and there's the truth of what I'm offering you. You can only walk in one of those. Religion, you hop on a Sunday morning and you play spiritual, and then you have to live in the truth who you are. Gospel, Jesus goes, I'm gonna get the truth about who you are and I'm gonna do something, a new gift in your life, through your life, so that if they ever, ever play that scene from your life here at Southwest, you're gonna look at it and go, man, that was me. Let me tell you who I am today and what I've done. Isn't that amazing? There's a true story from the late 1800s about a pastor named Brownlow North. 
Brownlow grew up around Aberdeen. His father left his mom as a single parent with all of his siblings when he was young. Brownlow grew up in the streets fending for himself. He became quite a pickpocket, quite a little thief, not only to supply for himself, but also many times for his family. And as that turned into his teenage years, it meant some time with the law. But in one of those aspects, he ran into a Christian gentleman who put his arm around Brownlow and told him, you're destined for something better for that. And just started whispering Jesus into his life. Into his 20s, Brownlow gave his life to the Lord. Went to a Christian university and became a minister. And in his mid-30s, he was asked to come back to speak at his home church in Aberdeen. This was a big day for Brownlow North. Brownlow was sitting in the front pew of his church in Aberdeen, amazed at God's grace. He grew up around this church, stealing from the people in this church. And today he's delivering the message. And right before the music started, there was a hand on his shoulder that dropped a little letter. And he opened it, and it simply said, I know who you are, the family you've come from, and what you've done. If you dare get up to disgrace our church, I will shout out to everyone the truth about you. And this fear hit Brahma. And through three hymns he didn't sing, he prayed. And he glanced over his shoulder and he saw a woman in the back of the church just standing with her arms crossed, being eyes right at him. And when the third song was done and the introduction was made, Brownlow walked to the stage. He said, before anyone speaks in this room today, I have a letter I want to read you. And he read that letter out loud. And he said, everything that woman in the back knows about me is true and there's a whole lot more. And today I'm going to tell you about how I found forgiveness and freedom from all of that. I heard that story in my sixth year of being a youth pastor up in East L.A. No one in my youth group could know that in the little cubby in my office, I had two cardboard boxes folded flat in the back wall. I was sure there was someone from North San Diego County that was going to come up one day, find out I was posing as a youth pastor, and they would tell my church who I was from 88 to 93. And it would all come crumbling down. And the moment the rug was pulled out from under me, I would grab those cardboard boxes, unfold them, grab whatever I had in my personal supplies, and I would leave that church, and I would never return. Every Sunday, I'm teaching high school kids in the inner city about the love of God and forgiveness, and I'm asking and saying prayers for stuff in my life that I can't get over. And I read that story, and I realized I've never tasted freedom. I've never gone to the well. I've never walked on the beach when Jesus grabs Peter who denied him and cursed he didn't know anything about him and simply said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Because I know you betrayed me. You betrayed me. You betrayed me. And I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm here to let you know I know the truth and I still love you and I really, really like you. We've got to get to the place where we stop running from our past, but we face it, we accept it, and then we accept grace and guilt. You can only walk in one truth. You can walk in the truth of who you are and what you've done and what's been done to you, or you can walk in the truth of the windshield of what God has given you today and what he calls you. You are son, you are daughter, you are prince, or you are princess in the kingdom of God. You can only choose one. It's your choice. But ever since the cross, let me remind you, guilt is not a feeling, it's a choice. It's a choice. You don't need forgiveness. You need to take your past and you need to sit there today at your own well with him and say, God, thanks for this. Not that it happened, but God, thank you. Not that it was done. God, thank you. Not that I did it. God, thank you. Not that it was done to me, but God, thank you that in spite of my life, here's how you see me today. Here's what you've given me today. I choose to walk in the way you see me. That's a higher truth. And every time you go to raise those hands and that little voice, I don't know if it's demonic. I don't know if it's our sin nature. I don't know if it's, I don't know where it comes from. I just know it's there. Every time you walk and try to worship God spiritually and the truth goes, really? You know what you've done with those hands? You raise them a little higher and you say, yes, and that's why I'm worshiping today. 
Exactly, I know who I am. I know what I've done, and I know what he calls me today. See, that is your moment at the well. Otherwise, you're gonna have a great spiritual morning. You're gonna go back to the heat, and you're gonna go back to who you are. And there's a day coming. In fact, it is now here where real worship is not religious. It's not spiritual. It's spirit and truth. Because our past will be Satan's greatest weapon or God's most powerful tool. That is a choice. Our past will be Satan's greatest weapon against us or God's most powerful tool. Your past is being used against you. Or you're gonna find freedom from it. That every time that thought comes, you take a cab and say, God, you know exactly who I am and what I've done and where I've come from. Thank you for calling me son, daughter, prince, princess, and the windshield you give me today. And there will be a moment in your life where you're gonna find someone else by a well. And you're gonna go, hey, I used to live at that well. And you're gonna find an incredible tool in your life that none of us have. Because you have the scars that bring freedom, not shame. Your past will be what Satan uses against you and draws a wedge between you and God. Or it'll become the very thing that you run back to your town and three times tell everybody everything that's ever been done to me, he knows. And now they have their own story because they heard her story. The very thing she tried to hide is the very thing now she shares. The very thing that had control over her is the very tool now that God is using for her friends and her neighbors and her life. That is what he had to do then. That is what he has to do now. May I remind you as the children's workers are wondering why in the world no one is coming to rescue them. <laughs> that in the kingdom of God, failure, failure is simply an event. It is never a person. It is never a person. You are not unworthy. You are not unlovable. You are not damaged. You are not broken beyond repair. You are simply choosing to live in guilt and shame. When there is a gift that is being offered, and the God that says, meet me with your truth. And let me show you what I've done for it and with it. Three days later, she stops inside the door. She grabs a scarf and she pulls it around her neck. And as she's about to pull it over her head, it's just a habit. With a genuine smile on her face, she just tucks it back around. She is going to the well at 5.30 a.m. in the morning because she knows she's still the talk of the town. Some that believe, some that will still judge, but either way, she has a story to share. And because of who she found and what she's found, she's not afraid to share the story. And she will stop at the racks of the silk cloth for as long as she wants. And if they want to whisper, let them whisper. She is a daughter, a princess in the kingdom of God. Oh, what a story. Oh, what a story. Father God, may you protect this church. May you allow these people to be the type of church that allowed those people. Oh, God, forgive us if there's anybody in our life that we still consider those people. May your grace and mercy so break us down that these arms will love others the way you loved us. May this be a church that crosses every border, every track, every boundary to show your love. And God, may this be a church where we teach not just forgiveness, but that we walk in freedom. Freedom. Because we know whose we are, not just what we've done. May today we choose the higher truth. May we walk in it. May we apply this prayer daily until it becomes nothing but a source of encouragement. God, thank you for forgiveness and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May we choose that the way you've chosen us. Father, for the prayer teams that are in the back, may we be open for those that are walking out today that simply need to pray. 
Oh, if you've got something in your life, church, that you need to deal with God today, may you grab someone in the back with a lanyard on. You don't have to be open. You don't have to be specific if you want. All you have to say if you want is, hey, pray for me because I need to go to the well. (laughs) Pray for me because I got to deal with truth. Just take that step and let someone pray for him today. God, may you bless this pastor and his family. May you bless this church. May this be a beacon of light to every Samaritan that feels like they've blown it, they've lost their chance, and they are unlovable. And may your gospel win. May it win. And may everything else lose. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming today. You're dismissed.